Hello everybody, this is Michael Hollands once again for Sound of the Movies. Today I have the pleasure to be joined by Emmy Award winning composer Frederik Wiedmann. His scoring career started back in 2003. As of then, he has worked on many films such as Return to the House on Haunted Hill, Cyrus, Hellraiser Revelations, Field of Lost Shoes, Hostel 3, Vengeance, A Love Story, Hangman and many more. Besides making an impact on films, Frederick also wrote tremendous scores for animation projects, such as Green Lantern, the animation series, Justice League, Gods and Monsters Chronicles, All Hail King Julian, and The Dragon Prince, another big recent Netflix production. Welcome, Freddy. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, Freddy, you were born in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, please tell our <laughs> listeners about your developments in music, how you became interested in music, especially film music, and how you began studying music. So for me, <clears throat> it was kind of strange. Like I've been there since I was, I think, 12 or 13 years old. There was nothing I wanted to do except become a film composer. It's, it's, a, it's, it's something you don't hear a lot. And, you know, my colleagues, too, that I talk about this kind of stuff. It's, it, Usually they kind of fell into it by having a rock career first or becoming a classical composer and then transitioning into that. But in my case, when I bought my first soundtrack um, from John Barry's Dances with Wolves, that's when I first fully consciously understood that film music is something people do. And I was just from that point on, first of all, a film music geek. And also, um, you know, having played the violin for many years at that point, and starting to play guitar, it was just music was part of my life already. So it was a very natural process for me to go from performing to stu studying music theory and starting started to composing my own, my first few pieces on my own um, at, at, at such an early age. I think a big pivotal part for me was going to um, <clears throat> switching from violin to guitar with my guitar teacher Hans Hartzot in Augsburg because he was a jazz guitar player and he sort of introduced me to this whole world of music theory in the first place. And once I kind of had cr cracked that door open, I, it was just there was no stopping me from completely indulging into this area of music. And I've become, I became obsessed with music theory and jazz and the real book and analyzing music and transcribing pieces on the piano myself. So it sort of opened this whole world for me that I didn't know existed. And yeah, from that point on, you know, combined with being a film music, um, a passionate person about film music, I just, you know, pursued that one path ever since then, all the way through um, my Abitur and Zivildienst, that's, that's just all I wanted to do. So the next logical step for me was to uh, find a college or university that could teach me more about this. And back then in 2002, when it was time for me to do that, there was very few options out there compared to now. Right now you have media music and movie composition. It's, it's a very common major at all the major colleges now. But back then there was very few options. So my first idea was to go to um, Norbert Jürgen Schneider's uh, course in Munich because it was so close to my hometown in Augsburg. And when I met him at a, at a seminar in, in the Berlin Olympia Halle, about his music, I approached him afterwards and asked if how I could go about applying, to which he simply said, they're full for the next five years, I shouldn't even bother trying. And that was kind of, okay, well, then the only other option is Berkeley College of Music in Boston. And after some, you know, convincing my parents that this is a good idea, I made, made the leap over the ocean after my um, civil service TV dienst in England and started, yeah, film music composition at Berkeley in Boston. And after that, again, all I wanted to do was score movies. So I just headed straight to Los Angeles the moment I graduated and started working. And yeah, I haven't stopped since. Berkeley at this point when you entered already had a film music course, right? Correct. They offered a bachelor in film music. I mean, many composers started out in Berkeley. I mean, Alan Silvestri being one of them. And mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a great stepping stone for young, inspiring composers to really learn learn the ropes and learn the craft of film music. 
It really is. I mean, Berkeley was an incredible time for me. I still look back at it now that it's been, uh, you know, 16 years, 17 years of my studies there. It was still one of the absolute highlights of my life, just being a college student and then studying this. This one thing that I'm so entirely passionate about was just an amazing time. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, they have been a great help of me getting the foot in the door once I got to LA. And that was an absolute invaluable asset after coming from Berkeley to have people that are Berkeley people that really help you to, to, to get your foot in the door in the studios and with other composers. You know, it's, it's really just been an, an amazing experience to be, to be um, just uh, supported this way from a college. And, you know, once I, once I had my first assistant job for composer John Frizzell, yeah. I, that's when I really started to learn everything besides the basic technical skills that Berkeley taught me. Because, you know, as you know, being a composer requires so much more than just writing music and understanding what punches and streamers are and, you know, how to, how to uh, write a melody. There is so much more to it in terms of politics, how to sell a cue, what do you do in a room, in a tough room, when there's clients rejecting music? I mean, there's all these lessons that are just, you know, impossible to get at any college and that you really only can get when you work with somebody like, like John full time and you're in the room with him and you're just through the whole process start to finish. So after having done that for three years for him, this is when I, I passed the baton to somebody else, so to speak, and moved on to start on my own because at that point I had gathered plenty of credits by my, uh, you know, myself while working for John Frizzell and my little couple of movies that I'd scored aside from that. That was enough for me to, to get started. You mentioned John Barry early on. Would you say he was the most influential composer for you personally? <clears throat> well, it's certainly, I would say yes, because he ignited the spark in the very first place. I can't, I can't recall anybody else that that did that. that. I, there was one LP my dad had from this trio that made, they, they made a trio, it was like a bass, piano, drums, oh, and harmonica, a quartet, sorry. It was this little band, this German band, they made an LP of famous film music themes. And there was a couple of things on there that um, I had never seen, like movies like Avanti Avanti and things like that, like, you know, movies that my, my parents have known, but I had never obviously seen as an 11 year old. But there was um, uh, Once Upon a Time in the West from Morricone on there as well. And I think that may have been the first time that I fell in love with a piece of film music. But I think John Barry's score was really the one that um, I consciously remember as, oh my God, I have to do this in my life. This is amazing. Um, you know, besides being a big fan of the movie itself, uh, it was really great to just study the score inside out and listen to it on repeat while building my Legos in my room. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, John Barry is a pretty good choice, actually. I mean, he was one of the the best of in the business. And, for instance, Dances with Wolves, also one of my all-time favorite scores. Yeah. It still holds up, I think. You know, if I listen does, to it now, it's, it does. it's absolutely gorgeous. And I think this score uh, basically symbolizes pretty much everything, at least to me, that John Barry stands for as or stood for as a composer no i i agree i mean this is he's he is so incredibly thematic and uh and emotional and i mean he just pulls on the heartstrings just in the right way uh, that just the movie needed i think i mean from everything from james bond to out of africa it doesn't matter what he touched i always thought he's it was an incredible experience to hear his stuff in action which composer do you think is the most versatile and best working today? <clears throat> um, yeah, there's a couple. I mean, I think the top two is probably still James Newton Howard, in my opinion. And then right after that, I would say Christoph Beck. Huge fan of his stuff, too. And I think, you know, if you listen to his music, there is such an amazing variety of styles that he produces. I'm talking about Chris right now. Um, that uh, to me is absolutely mind blowing, and he excels in every genre. Not just you know he's not just the classical guy who does a pretty good job at ele electronic stuff, but he's really good at that too. I'm a huge fan of his smaller scores that not many people know, but um, 
like Confidence and Runner Runner. I don't know if you've heard those yet. Yeah. But to me, those are incredibly well-crafted electronic scores, just like in a, on a level that nobody else does, in my opinion. And then you hear things like Frozen or uh, Percy, Percy Jackson, um, Ant-Man. I mean, the list goes on where it just gets... Music has epic proportions, but it ends up being just just as skilled and nuanced as anything else. So I think he's one of the one of the top versatile guys that I can think of for for big movies. In fact, somebody asked me the other day if I were a filmmaker today and could pick my composer, who would I hire? I would. I said hands down Christoph Beck because <laughs> he could do anything. Yeah, it's a uh, it's pretty difficult actually. There are so many top guys. I think Christoph Beck is a pretty good choice. I like his work a lot, and I wholeheartedly agree with um, James Newton Howard. I, yeah. Yeah, um, I think we um, at one point um, exchanged some mails about this, and yeah, I think James Newton Howard is um, the best, most versatile composers out there today, and also my personal favorite. Mm, good. Yeah. No, he's a he's you know after. After all these years, I think he still produces incredible work. He does not appear to be slowing down. No, there is no <laughs> wit and no quit no, in good. James Newton Howard. I mean, there are so many, so many top guys. I mean, James and Danny Elfman and Zimmer and Harry Gregson Williams, Thomas Newman. The list goes on and on. And um, yeah, it's a it's a business in which, or a business which has produced so many, so many greats. And great performers and writers and uh, it's it's an awesome business I agree it's a it's a whole lot of fun to be right in it <laughs> I, that much I can tell you who do you think is the best ever the best ever mm -hmm. like unreachable by anybody else I would say that's absolutely John Williams okay I don't think there will ever be anybody like him I mean he's just one of a kind brilliant iconic it's that there is nothing else like it. I, I can't think of anybody who could get even close to the amount of influence in film music that John Williams had on the industry and film itself. Good point, good point. I already um, figured you might say John Williams. Though. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think there's another answer. You know, I mean, Hans Zimmer is certainly influential in his own, in his own right, but there is people that can that can sound like Hans Zimmer because and there's plenty of them, as you can, you just turn on the TV and half the shows you're watching is this, so people trying to sound like Hans Zimmer. But uh, I think Williams is a different animal because he's just so down to the roots of the actual composing process that I think people in today's world no longer are. And that's why he's, he'll remain one of a kind. Yeah. John Williams, fantastic composer, genius yeah. composer, and I love his work. But I must say, I think the best of all time, and that's a pretty tough um, um, pretty tough subject I would go with Jerry Goldsmith he's certainly one of the the, the greats of our you know of film music's lifespan so to speak I mean he has an incredible amount of body of work as well and uh, yeah I mean what an amazing storyteller with music I've I still think that his scores also is, is some of the few old scores that still would hold up in today's modern world um, he he's been he back then already wrote very contemporary music that you know would totally work today, and you can't say that about every composer I think from that time period. Okay, uh, let's get back to your full-time work as a composer, and you started <laughs> working many years ago, and you had worked on several TV shorts, and subsequently you worked on movies and horror films. Also, such as Hostel 3 and Cyrus and Hellraiser Revelation, how do you approach a horror movie? What do you think is important for those films, musically speaking, um, underscoring jump scares or atonal music or trying to use different sounds and melodies? What's, what's important for you personally? Horror films are very particular. You might think that the thing that's important is the jump scares and coming up with new creepy strings, you know, once again. But ultimately, yes, that is a big component of it. But to me, what really makes a good horror movie is figuring out 
the actual heart of the story. What in this film should you really care about that will then cause you to feel the horror even more when things go south? And often that's, I think, horror movies sometimes ignore that when you just have creepy music even in sentimental scenes which completely take away from the intention that you're supposed to really care for this character that is now going to endure a violent death. You know, things like that. So I, when I watch a horror movie, I, I always try to nail down what is the thing that we all need to really care about. And then I try to, with amongst all the horror and the discomfort I'm creating with the music, I try to really emphasize those moments with my score to help create that connection between the audience and that subject, just so that when things go bad, we really are a lot more horrified. And I think to me that's that's a big key and often very tricky. And sometimes movies themselves miss that. Like they, they, it's just not in the script that one thing that we really should care about. It's all about the gore and the horror. In which case, what I just said doesn't really apply. But there is a lot of movies where that's the case, and um, I think that's really important. Like for example, if you're looking at these really successful horror movies, uh, con the, the Conjuring and Insidious, yes. those are I think excellent examples of that, where you have something this family or this couple that you really get to involved with, to be involved with, and, and those need to be accentuated accordingly. And then the other big thing that I always, um, I'm very conscious of when I mean, scoring horror is um, silence, the element of silence, like how, where is the moment of no music or barely any sound design? Um, also something that in a lot of horror movies is, is unfortunately not well taken care of because they plaster it with sound and songs and music that you barely have the opportunity to just feel this room and the creaking of the tiles or the, the floor, you know, those kind of things. Uh, I think that's an important thing. So the emotional context, silence, and then of course, how can I recreate something scary that hasn't been done before that is somewhat unique but still evokes the same amount of of amount of discomfort in the audience than before, you know, without using, referring to the same tools that you that you did on the last three movies. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, like you said, it's difficult. I mean, The Conjuring being a prime example, or many or many horror films today that uh, are focusing on on jump scares as opposed to let's say creepy atmosphere and storytelling, and um, I think many of these. Of these films are limited musically and when you look at horror films like Pet Cemetery, for instance which was scored by Elliot Goldman Fall right. it's a whole different animal it's a whole different beast mm -hmm. because that's a horror film which does not rely on on jump scares necessarily but it mainly focuses on telling a story and creating this amazing atmosphere and still one of my all-time favorite horror films the, the sub, one of the horror films which has the very best atmosphere at least from where i'm sitting and that's a horror film which i think offers the composer a whole different approach yep yeah that's a great example i think so too um another one i just thought of that is a really good one in terms of silence and emotional context is alien I know it's not really a horror movie, but um, just that to me was also, you know, that Goldsmith score of the first Alien movie yeah. was just genius. And in, 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 in combination with the filmmaking approach and the shots, the camera moves, the silence, it was just an absolute perfect synergy. And a tough project, um, also, yeah. uh, also according to Jerry Goldsmith. I mean, he, Correct. Yeah, yeah, I've read those he had too. quite a lot of stories to um, to tell about this one, how difficult it was. And I must say, well, I believe it was. Yep, that often happens. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Freddie, uh, you are also very experienced writing for superhero characters. I mean, you scored the Justice League, Gods and Monsters, as well as Justice League. And Teen Titans. How did you balance the sound of the music, which had, had already been recorded and written at some point, and the, um, your own personal style, writing new themes, new orchestration? How did that work out for you? 
Well, you know, when I started my first um, animated project movie, uh, was, which, was, which was Justice League Flashpoint Paradox, it was, I was told to basically ignore everything that's ever been done and just completely start fresh. We are not going to hint on any theme from any of the previous DC movies ever done. They wanted to create their own new story with those characters and those particular voice actors um, of this whole series of comic books of the new 52. And I was, um, you know, they, we had this discussion, like, should this Batman be at all reminiscent of Chris Nolan's Batman or Danny Elfman's Batman? And, and the answer was no. They wanted something completely fresh and new themes and just basically start over. And it was really nice to be able to do that because I didn't know back then when I scored my first film that I would be doing 12 of these in the next, you know, five to six years. Um, and so since I was basically used for most of those movies that are all part of the same universe, I was almost able to structure this as one giant TV show. You know, everything is very cohesive. All the characters have real reoccurring themes in each of the movies. And it all kind of ties in nicely together, but it's all new material freshly created for this particular franchise. In 2015, you had scored the music for the war drama uh, Feel of Lost Shoes, which is mm -hmm. my personal fav favorite of all the scores you've written so far. Oh, thank you. Could you walk me through the scoring process <coughs> of that film? How did you capture the... Um, emotion or which character or which scene was a key factor for you? I mean, the, it's a tough movie from the angle that it's a civil war movie from the perspective of the South. You know, that in itself in today's landscape is, is a little bit of a tough sell because you're kind of rooting for the bad guys. You kind of have to root for the bad guys, you know, for the people that wanted slavery. Um, so it's strange to do something from that perspective, but all that aside, it was important to understand that that was not what the movie was about. What the movie really was about was these young 16, 17, 18 year old kids from this VMI Institute, the cadet school in Virginia, that they rose to the occasion in the midst of this horrible battle and may have they, they, did, they did this heroic act, completely selfless, self-sacrificing heroic act that ended up helping them win this particular battle. Not the war, as we know, but it's, it's basically a story about human sacrifice and belonging together as one and doing what's necessary to basically accomplish what your people need, regardless of what the overall agenda is. So I kind of try to do my best to ignore the fact that I'm creating something to create sympathy for the South, the Southern people in this war. And basically just completely focus on the boys, the cadets, and what their journey is on, and, and what leads them to the decision to do what they did, which is, you know, just barge in and storm this one hill during the battle, even though they were surrounded by gun and cannon fire. But it was their absolute last reserve to make any progress in this battle. So I had to come up with several key themes to make that happen, which, first of all, it's the quasi-heroic Americana-style uh, cadet theme, which also opens the movie and ends the movie kind of as a bookend. You can hear it very clearly in the main title. And then there is a, there is a love theme between one of the cadets and uh, that girl that was working in near the cadet school that also has that love story just develops as much as the boys' journey. So I had to make sure that that's a strong theme that can reoccur in all those moments where it mattered, including the end when she's running around the battlefield trying to find her wounded lover, so to speak, a boyfriend, and uh, and is unable to. And so that, that, that was the climactic point of that particular love theme. Yeah, and um, yeah, it was just interesting, you know, because like I said, I... I John Barry was one of my all-time favorites, and soon after that, I completely fell in love with James Horner. And one of my favorite scores of all time was always Glory. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, and, uh, and I, even during my, my days at Berkeley, I had to write a paper about Glory. It was part of my, part of, part of my class, which was one of my the most fun paper I ever had to write, if you think about it, of all the papers. Like, I had to dissect 
James Horner's Score for Glory, which was super fun. But um, just well, by doing that, I realized that, God, I really want to spread a score like that one of those days in my, my career. Like just a big, epic, thematic, Civil War era period drama piece. And when I got the first cut from Field of Lost Shoes from the cutting room, I realized they had put in temp score from Glory all over the thing. <laughs> so I was like, okay, this is it. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. <laughs> so I just took this as a little blessing that, you know, they, they cut in my favorite score. Okay, awesome. And, I, you know, of course I tried to make it my own. And uh, But I think the general idea is very similar. It's this big, grand, thematic, orchestral, you know, emotional, people in war, human sacrifice themed kind of movie. So it was it lent, it lent itself very nicely for that approach. Absolutely. James Horner, a great example. I mean, not, um, not only in terms of glory, but in general, one of the all time greatest composers. Absolutely, I agree. I agree. I mean, I, I think honestly, my favorite score of his is, is one that may very few people know, but it's um, Iris. I don't yes, know if you're familiar with that. One. That is just drop dead gorgeous music to me. That's one of his best. Freddie, uh, when working on a film or series, what is the most important or challenging aspect for you, and also the most terrifying when working with directors and producers? I think the most terrifying is when you're working with new people for the first time, you know, people that do not know you. And you have to get to know them. And then you play the music for the first time. That is, you know, still to this day, I've done, you know, over 120 projects since uh, the last 10 years. But it, this part just does not get any easier. And I think Hans Zimmer once said that very uh, cleverly when he pointed out that doing that, and he's talking about that same experience. So even he has, even he has the pins and needles when he's doing this, even for people he's very familiar with. But when you're first time, when you're playing your score for the first time to people, it's like you're completely exposing yourself. It's almost he used the analogy like it's almost as if you're naked. Uh, you have no idea what they're going to think of it and how they're going to respond. It's very interesting that experience. And then of course, when it goes well, it's one of the most exhilarating things you can possibly have in this business. When it goes, when it doesn't go well, it's very very difficult and often painful. But you know, thankfully, that almost never happens for me, at least in, the, in recent in, in recent years. But uh, yeah, that's that's by far the most the, the most challenging moment is that first meeting. You know, the spotting session is easy because you don't you're not showing anything yet. You're just talking about stuff. There's nothing there's nothing to do. But the first time playing your score is is always daunting. Certainly, the most the most fulfilling and rewarding moment is when you are sitting on the dub stage when everything is approved fully recorded and mixed and you're finally seeing it played together with all the final sound effects and final visual effects on the dub stage with the crew and you know when things start to suddenly completely fall into place that's a really great experience to be able to just watch it all unfold and you realize you've made a movie at that point and that's very that's the most fun uh, rewarding moment i think in the whole process and then, of course, while you're so happy and, and excited about this, you, the fear of what gig will be next sinks in right after that. <laughs> so it doesn't last that long. Yeah. <laughs> but then you, that project is finished. And then what do you do next? In 2018, you had started working on Dragon Prince, the big animation series presented by Netflix. Two albums have been released featuring more than two hours of your music. And given your experience in this genre, would you say that this one particularly was more demanding in terms of writing for all characters and the whole story as as opposed to other projects? I wouldn't call it more demanding. Um, I would just call it more fun. Because a lot of times in modern film scoring and movies, you're asked to keep yourself restrained musically. You know, the, the aesthetic of scores these days, as you, I'm sure you're noticing, is especially in dramas and, and thrillers, is to reserve music and make minimal impact on the story with, what you are, with your tools. Um, and often that's, that's challenging. Like, how little do I need to do to just do just enough without stepping on what's in the picture, without 
taking away what's coming and all these things. In The Dragon Prince, it's a little bit of a different story because it's like it's like the showrunners described it. It's Lord of the Rings for, the, for kids. And it, that in itself, that statement kind of tells you that you can just go for it. The music is front and center. It's its own character in the show. It needs to be heard. It needs to be part of it. So I should never be afraid to play a theme, play it fully through, play it loud, and play it when the character shows up on screen. So I, it, there's this nice boundary that's removed from me here that I can just do my own dramatic storytelling with the music without too much holding back. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just a very inviting canvas for me to paint on. When you started working on the project, how did you <coughs> find that first idea, which you could then flesh out into a full score? Well, we, we had the luxury in this particular project where they hired me six months before we scored the pilot, the first episode. Which, that's an unusual thing. I mean, from all the TV shows I've done so far, usually it's get hired and go. Um, here's the pilot, let's go. We have two weeks and then we mix and we figure everything out in this time period. And for The Dragon Prince, I had this enormous amount of time to really sit down and just absorb the scripts, the story, look at the, con the concept art, since they didn't have a single frame animated at that point. And look at the character designs, backgrounds, you know, concept art of Zadia, the, the, the world this, this story takes place in. And just by the, with the creatives, the conversations I had with the creatives to come up with things that we think might be the right way to go. And it was very nice to just sit down on a complete blank slate with just these few images and the, the rough story in my head and sketch out thematic material introduce instruments to my showrunners. Like we immediately had this idea that we wanted to use unorthodox ethnic things from all around the globe to um, emphasize the uniqueness of this world that we're, that we're in. And yeah, I just spent a whole lot of time just recording a bunch of stuff, sketching out themes, developing them, sending it over to them like, hey, what do you guys think of this? And yeah, and, and with, with that, we've created about 40 minutes of unique material that was basically just music concept music that yeah is um that was our starting point and then basically based from that when we all agreed on this is the sound this is the palette this is how big this is how small we're going to be in certain moments that's when i received episode one and what was really great at that point was because everyone already knew all the themes and they knew them inside out so every time i would just hint on them they would immediately the showrunners them I'm talking about now, they would immediately pick up on it and point it out to me and said, oh, I love how you used the Callum theme right here. And this is great. The Zadia theme comes in here. So it was really nice to have that familiarity established without having to get there. You know, often you, you establish new themes in the beginning of a project and people need to get used to them. They hear them a few times and then when they really know them, they can really respond to them. And in this case, it was nice we had that set up and it was that made it very smooth as a start um yeah and, and you know <laughs> i have this 40 minutes of music still here and i don't think there's been a single theme in these that we haven't used yet so everything that i've created somehow found a home in the first season and has therefore been developed into the second season as well maybe one day they will release those somewhere it would be kind of fun to see <laughs> so there's going to be more music well, there is, I mean, I have like 40 minutes of Dragon Prince music that is basically all the themes we already have on the soundtrack now, but in a different version. Mm -hmm. It was just me basically messing around with them and seeing what, what does it sound like if you play it on a cello with small orchestration? What does it sound like if the same theme is played by a duduk, but half the tempo? You know, those kind of things. There have been 18 episodes so far in two seasons, and... Mm -hmm. You mentioned the um, the time pressure that sometimes you have to figure out within two weeks what to do and how to write a full a full score for one episode. What was it like working on eighteen episodes? Did you have different deadlines for each episode, or no? It's about the same. I mean, you know, you, for animation, you get a little bit more time, and it's only because they need more time to make it. You know, but live action, once the edit's done, they're good to go to the final mix. They're just basically waiting for you. But in animation, there's always more things that need to be rendered or that they're swapping out or 
doing what's called a retake when this when something is wrong they have to reanimate it you know even if it's just a one second uh, cut but it still takes time for all the rendering so in animation you generally get two weeks for an episode where whereas in live action tv you, you often don't get more than just one so it's it's quite a nice amount of time to score 23 minutes of music um so yeah it's it's not stressed at all I, there's I, I do it in about a week then I get feedback and I have about a week to do any revisions and then send it to the mix stage. So it's a it's a fairly relaxed schedule. And, you know, since we didn't know about season two until later on, there was a little bit of a break between season one and season two because they had to, you know, obviously make the episodes first before I could start. Did you record the score in Los Angeles? No, we, um, this is, the budget on this show was, uh, on the, the music part was, you know, didn't allow for for live recordings in Los Angeles. Um, we did a session in Macedonia with forty with a forty piece orchestra, and only for key scenes that really need that really benefited from from uh, live recording. And that, for example, we recorded the main title live. We recorded the end credits live only because they're going to be playing every time, and we wanted those to really sound as good as possible. And then we also recorded the opening of the pilot, the introduction to Zadia and the story. That first piece was um, also live recorded, and uh, yeah, it was really great to have the ability to do that. You know, in animation, in especially this kind of content for children and older kids and young young adults, it's you, it's very rare that you see a show where they get to record any live orchestra at all. You know, Family Guy and The Simpsons are kind of the exception with this with this type of thing. So we were very lucky that we were even be able, that we were able to do that much on this on this show. And then, of course, there's a whole bunch of solo live recording happening throughout the whole season and season two. You know, with solo strings and winds. I have all the woodwinds recorded in every episode, together with the Armenian duduk and cellos and violins and vocals and all those things. So those sessions are constantly happening and those are happening in, in Los Angeles. Great. Many sessions today, as I understand, feature separate recordings of different instruments or brass section, string section, then the choir and it's all mixed together. How do you like to work personally? Well, if you know, there's a lot of, I know it's for film music fans, they, I've, I've heard very dismissive things about st st recording and splits, um, but in the, at the end of the day, it's really an amazing way to work for many reasons. Um, if I have the ability and the budget to do so, I, I do it myself. First of all, you can really get the mix to exactly how you want it in the end. Um, you have the ability to lower the strings when you need and vice versa, brass, woodwinds, percussion. Um, and you can really produce them in a much more intricate way. I always, you know, I always use the example of um, these How to Train Your Dragon scores from John Powell, which I absolutely adore. They, they would never sound this good if you would put the band all in one room and record them all together. If you would not get the same result. And one day maybe somebody will make that experiment and AB the two. But uh, there is a lot to be said for being able to modify individual elements, you know, tighten them up rhythmically so that it's really on the beat versus, versus sloppy, you know, because it's just a human performance after all. So I think splitting it out, splitting it out um, if you have the ability, is still a wonderful tool. And it also gives filmmakers the ability to adjust levels on the dub stage when they're doing the final mix without affecting the whole score, you know? Like, let's say there is a a car taking off, a race car, and that engine sound is a half step above the trombones in pitch, and everybody says it's kind of clashing with the music. Well, guess what? You are able to just remove the trombones for that couple of seconds, but keep everything else. Whereas when everybody's in one room, you'd either have to live with the dissonance or just you know lower the entire piece in one, and that's, to me, always a big sacrifice. That's a very interesting point, actually, because I have heard composers say they prefer a recording featuring the entire orchestra a 2d session so to speak and i have heard people say well 
sometimes the business requires or let's say producers require us to record in separate sessions there are i think pros and cons for each aspect you made a pretty good point about the um, the mixing but also composers told me and they said i prefer hearing every instrument live when i conduct the orchestra and i think it also the entire orchestra benefits from the complete performance with everybody yeah. in the room because they can hear each other and they know how to adjust perhaps if yeah. you if you record the brass it's just the brass if you add the strings it's just the strings but hearing the entire elements the um the um the conductor might change the pace or he might you know uh, make different adjustments and then well the individual group might say well okay i need to to fix something and then we do another take and it all sounds different altogether so it's a pretty difficult aspect here yes no there's valid points for both sides absolutely i mean it's a Often it's also a budget question. I mean, if I'm paying for all this myself, you know, as part of a package deal, yeah. so doing striping just suddenly costs you four times as much. And that's, you know, you got to make the decision if that's really what you need to do. If the studio pays for everything, it's a different, it's a different story. But in my world, I mostly, I mostly deal with package deals where it's, uh, here's your money, you, you use it as you see fit. And often it doesn't even allow me the option to do it split. Yeah, I guess it's difficult also in terms of, you know, who's paying for it and also if, if, a, yeah. it's, if it's a union gig or it's... Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I heard, for example, I can't verify this, it's just a rumor from friends and colleagues, but people like Henry Jackman, uh, who I also adore massively of, of all his music, he, I think, as far as I was told, has everybody in a room and they rehearse it all together, but then he does record separate afterwards. So he gets the opportunity to let everybody hear it in context, and then they strip it out. And maybe that's the ideal solution uh -huh. you know, to kind of do both. Like, here's what it, here's what everybody else does. Now let's just do the strings. Okay, sounds sounds interesting. It's a it's a valid mm -hmm. point, and that might also be a huge factor in terms of recording schedule. Because if you have, let's say, well, at Abbey Road, for instance, you have let's say four days to record, and you let's say try to experiment there might not be enough time because if, if time is a factor and budget money is a factor we might to have we might have to find a different solution yep exactly you have to and and that's i think a great composer is somebody who can make it all work who can take the budget take the money and take the time and take the movie and make the absolute best out of it in the time and finance financial responsibilities that he's given um you know and that's that's ultimately our job is to to, to do the best job we can with what we're, what we're given how would you describe the dragon prince artistically and musically do you think this kind of a product will appeal not only to genre fans but also to a broader audience not only in terms i mean not only in terms of music but in terms of the, the show itself the show itself yeah 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 you know it's it's been really interesting um we've even had an article come out a few days ago at from forbes magazine where it says here are five animation shows that have a huge adult following and you know shira was part of it voltron and we were part of it too, Dragon Prince. So it was kind of nice to see that people are writing about it from that aspect because based on the based on the online response we've been getting on mostly Twitter and Tumblr, there has been an enormous amount of older fans or you know young adults that have been really into this show. Um, maybe even more so than young children. I don't know the demographics. You know, Netflix don't they don't really tell us. The details about this but certainly lots of older older people older children or younger adults are very much in love with the show and it's been really fun to see how they how they react to it and how they absorb it and and i think the show itself is made on that level it, it does appeal to young kids but it does also appeal to adults there's some very grown-up stuff in there that you know if you're younger you don't necessarily need to understand to still enjoy it but I think there's it's 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 got the appeal and story is complex enough that an older audience can certainly find it very enjoyable and entertaining. 
And yeah, the music too. I mean, you know, when I was working for Disney Junior on my other show, Miles from Tomorrowland, there was a big, a big thing that to constantly be aware of how intense and dark and scary the music can get because we're, we were mostly targeting preschoolers with this particular show. And I had to constantly remind myself of, like, don't use this drum because it's too big and don't use this and never use any string effects and those kind of things because that would just not work with this type of audience. And for the Dragon Prince, we're kind of trying to make it more accessible to really everybody. I mean, the music doesn't really, it doesn't really hold back when it in other areas might in other networks. So we have the ability to really go for it whenever we want to. And hopefully young kids will not get too scared and still find it enjoyable. <laughs> what is your opinion on streaming services such as Netflix? Do you believe this might be the cinema of the future? Yeah, I mean, I believe it already is, if you ask me. I mean, you know, Netflix won four Oscars this year. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. I mean, if you think about it, pretty a good, couple yeah. years ago, yeah, a couple years ago, everybody was like, what? Netflix won 66 Emmys? That's crazy. And then next thing you know, they won Golden Globes, and now they're winning Oscars. And it's like, okay, well, this is what it is now. There's Alfonso Cuaron that's making movies yeah. for Netflix. And I think, honestly, it, there's obviously pros and cons to everything including this, but I see this as a big opportunity for filmmakers to have another completely new platform where new things can be done and you can reach just as big of an audience than you can with a theatrical distribution. And I find that a very exciting place to be. And I'm you know, super happy to be part of it in some capacity with my show. Because I think it's wonderful that, that shows like Dragon Prince can find a home in yeah. this climate. Because sure. without Netflix, I don't know if anybody would greenlight a show like this, you know, I, I don't know enough about the studios, but Netflix certainly loves this, this, this type of material. And so here we are. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it creates a lot of good opportunity. For Absolutely. Me. Couldn't agree more, but there are also, of course, the usual pros and cons. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, Netflix people pay, I'd say 10 bucks a month where, uh, for a pretty huge format, you know, Netflix has a big, uh, portfolio, movie, series, Netflix uh, exclusive productions, and you get to watch whatever you want, so when, whenever you want, and that's a big plus. It's always a big yeah. plus. Yeah. And to be honest, 10 bucks a month for this program, for this format, it's nothing. Yeah. And yeah. That's, that's like a, a ticket for one movie depending on where where you live i mean yeah sometimes even you know 13 bucks 15 bucks 16 bucks you know yeah just for 17 one where i live <laughs> yeah and of course 17 uh, in 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 the u.s and also in los angeles so uh, and that's almost twice what you have to pay for one netflix program and but of course you know a theater experience is still a theater experience and um but the budget budget is also a big factor as well. You know, if you have a movie which costs you know, two hundred million dollars, you try to dis distribute it via the theaters, and you know you charge fifteen bucks or seventeen bucks or even twenty, and you need to, of course, make a lot of money. And um, but streaming services are so convenient they basically kill every local video store <laughs> if they haven't done that already and um, yeah. I mean, video stores were already in jeopardy 10 years ago uh, and um, nowadays with all the the big streaming services uh, you don't even have to bother getting up you know getting yeah you know, get out of I the mean, house it's, what's it like in germany we don't even have any anymore everything's closed all the blockbusters and the video services they're they're gone yeah. there's not a single one left do you have still some in germany video rental places we do TV yeah yeah, yeah. They, oh, okay. they and they they are they still exist um and um i was i was actually pretty surprised and a couple of years ago i was living in a in a near uh frankfurt germany mm -hmm. and in the same block, there were three video stores. That was like, what? <laughs> How is that even possible? And that was that was like 
That sounds like too much competition in this climate. My yeah, goodness. absolutely. That was like five, five years ago, six years ago. So, and, wow. um, but even today with all the um, development of, of Netflix and uh, so that's pretty much the future and soon everybody, everything will be about streaming also music wise. I mean, look at, you know, the legal streaming service, Amazon Unlimited, you can listen to whatever you want and you don't have to buy CDs anymore. Whereas that's pretty much, you know, also a shame because I'm also a collector and I love I'm old fashioned that way, I must admit. So I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I want to, uh, and, you know, just for, to get it, to get an impression of an album, what, what, what it sounds like, a streaming service is, is perfectly fine. But if you love the music, if you like the music, I feel I want to buy the city, the physical city. Yeah. Yeah, no, I hear you. A lot of people still do that. You know, I have all my physicals in the garage in a box, unfortunately, because <laughs> I have no space. But uh, yeah, I, there's certainly something, you know, like I remember this, this, these moments when you just go buy this one CD you really wanted and you're holding it in your hand. It's, it's a great feeling. There's nothing, it does not at all hold up to clicking on a download button. Freddie, what's, now we've talked a lot of about, you know, streaming service and all that stuff, but what's actually next for you? What are you currently working on? Uh, Batman Hush is next, the next Batman movie. It's called Hush. Yeah. I don't know if you know the comic book, but it's really, really fun movie. Can't I wait do. for that to come out later this year, I believe. And um, I'm also working on the new Doom movie for Universal. They're making a new Doom based on the video game film that we're also in post-production in. And it's, yeah, it's also coming up great. Very, very excited about that one as well. Freddie, Great. thank you so much for taking My so much time out of your schedule. We've talked for one hour now, and I really love talking to you. It was a huge pleasure, and it was a lot of fun, too. Likewise. And I hope to reconnect soon in the future. And I wish you just the best for all your future projects. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you soon. I hope to talk soon, and you have a good time. Great. Thank you so much, Michael. Mach's gut. Mach's gut. Bye-bye. Ciao.